Yes, yeah, Sharon, it's a big week for Katanji Brown Jackson, as you know. This weekend, the first black female Supreme Court nominee, or oh, she's been picking up endorsements. News website Axios reports a retired G.W. Bush Circuit Court appointee wrote to the Senate Judiciary Committee to support her. And Representative Jim Clyburn is urging strong bipartisan support. Big news that hit right before we left the air on Friday. Joining me to talk about this historic nomination and what comes next for Katanji Brown Jackson, BNC Justice Correspondent Candace Kelly, and Vice President of the Constitutional Accountability Center, Praveen Fernandez. Good morning to you both. Praveen, let's start off with you. Uh, if confirmed, uh, Brown Jackson, uh, she will be the first uh, African-American justice since Thurgood Marshall to have worked as a trial lawyer defending poor criminal defendants. So what perspective do you think that would bring to the high court? Well, thank you so much for having me. I, I think uh, it's an immeasurable benefit to have someone of Judge, uh, Judge Jackson's background wading through the thorny questions of accountability, law enforcement accountability, equal protection under the law for individuals who come before the court with criminal uh, criminal justice issues uh, before them. I, I think it will be huge. As you mentioned, uh, Judge Jackson would be the first person who has substantial criminal justice uh, background since Justice Marshall. But it's also true that Katanji Brown Jackson um, would be the first Supreme Court justice who comes to the court with a federal defender background. There has never been a federal defender, public defender, who is confirmed to the high court. That's a huge, huge um, enriching move for the court as they sort through thorny issues that have to do with criminal justice. Mm -hmm. Need that balance, need that perspective added there. Candace, uh, you know, you, we get a lot of insight uh, about uh, a judge's uh, philosophies, their legal philosophies, uh, based on their opinions on, on the court. So what decisions could come up during her confirmation hearings that, that could weigh either way for her? Well, you know, we've been hearing a lot about her decisions in terms of what it means to quickly deport immigrants, for example. She's decided on that. And also defending prisoners' rights. She does have record in terms of talking about prisoners' rights. Though when we look at the, the trial level that uh, and, and her experience there, there are about 500 opinions. There's not a lot that we can glean in terms of these hot button issues that we often hear about, whether it's abortion rights or gun rights or voting rights, things of that nature. But what Ravine has said is, is very important in that she brings this trial experience where you really have to sit through, listen to the evidence, listen to witnesses. And this is experience that most of the Supreme Court justices do not have. And so she's going to really kind of be a teacher, I think, to those people who are listening to her in the confirmation hearings about what it means to listen to facts. Mm -hmm. Because when it leaves her court, it actually goes all the way up potentially to the Supreme Court. So she's going to be able to talk Talk about what it means when it, those facts were heard on a much lower level when she when she actually decided certain cases that may even come before the Supreme Court. Who knows? But in terms of what she's going to be asked about, she definitely is going to be asked about abortion cases, the voting rights, these hot button issues. In fact, mm -hmm. the Supreme Court recently just took on the case to hear uh, in the next term whether or not someone can not service a gay couple when it comes to web designing and whether or not mm. they have that right as a private entity to do so. So they're going to ask her a lot about those particular issues. And she's actually, again, as I said, going to inform them and they will learn about the process because she has the experience that nobody else has had. Yeah, and, and you know, look, when it comes to the criminal justice system, we, we know, especially for black people, the criminal justice system, a lot of us feel like it's broken. Uh, she's going to get a lot of questions about that overall. She's got a family history, cops and criminals on that part. Uh, we know that's going to be more than likely brought up part of the hearing. So, but she's she's gotten ahead of that, hasn't she, Candace? She has. She got ahead of it. It wasn't really a secret that her uncle's cocaine conviction was commuted. I mean, by the time he did get out of prison, he was 78 years old and he died some months later. So while it's going to come up, I think it's almost moot, but kind of important for her to maybe explain. Um, and she got ahead of it. She was able to talk about it, contextualize it, and really construct her own narrative about what happened there. 
when her uncle's uh, conviction was commuted, there were 1700, 1700 other people whose convictions were also commuted. So it, it's not a big deal in that sense. But when we talk about the bipartisan effort um, and what Republicans want to do in order to bring her down, they are going to ask those questions. She is going to have the answers very methodically. I think one thing that's really interesting, I heard one of her former clerks say that she is a very methodical person, that she looks at the rule of the law and that a lot of her cases may look the same. And they asked her about that. And she said, they look the same because I look at the facts, I look at the people, I look at the law. And one thing that she also did, I'm not sure if she's going to do this on the Supreme Court, is that she read all of her opinions out loud before they went on record because mm -hmm. she wanted each sentence to make sense, Mike. Yes, yeah, she's uh, taking over for uh, Justice Breyer, uh, a guy she, uh, a justice she clerked for. She's got the experience, got the uh, endorsement of him. We also know that there are a lot of uh, lawmakers who don't give her the endorsement. A lot of them are saying because she's a black woman and because of uh, President Biden's um, uh, promise to uh, nominate a black woman, which he has. Uh, and we know that it won't change the position as far as like the 6-3 uh, favor of conservatives on the court. But she does give a voice to marginalized groups, Praveen, uh, Black Voters Matters, uh, police organizations uh, supporting her. How do you think that's going to help or hurt her during this Senate hearings? Do you think that's going to make it longer or shorter? Well, I'm not sure that it's going to make the, uh, the length of the hearings longer or shorter. Normally, Supreme Court justices go through uh, Senate Judiciary Committee hearings that are roughly three to four days uh, that involve pretty standard elements. Uh, the first day is normally the kind of uh, opening statements by senators and the nominee. The second day is normally questioning of uh, the Senate Judiciary Committee senators, questioning the nominee. And then the third day or fourth day is about a panel of outside experts. I don't know that the length will change. I think it might change the questions that are posed to her. Um, I, mm -hmm. I think Judge Jack has composed such a strong narrative of equal justice under the law. I think that uh, her narrative is already strong, and as as, as um, your colleague already pointed out, um, uh, she has she's taken control of that narrative and has a very methodical way of presenting both her background, her personal story, and what she would bring to the court. Real quickly, how, how do you think her decision to uh, reject keeping Donald Trump's uh, uh, January 6th White House records private? How do you think that's going to play out, Candace? Well, this is going to come up definitely. They're going to ask her, can she make a decision based on lines that are not political? I mean, that's the same question that they've asked any other Supreme Court justice. But this one's going to be particularly um, an issue and perhaps a hump for her, just in terms of the barrage of questions that they normally try to put on these, these nominees. But also because it's just a hot button issue right now. It's something that's going on right now during the time that she's being confirmed. So that's going to be a sticker, a stickling point, a sticker point. But it's something that, once again, with her methodical way of getting through things and actually explaining the law and how it's applied, which is how she functions, I think it's a hump that she will definitely get over pretty easily. But the questions are coming. Republicans are getting ready for this confirmation. Yeah, yeah, she's uh, qualified. She's well-deserving. But we also know that we live in a very political society where everything's challenged when it comes to Republicans versus Democrats, conservatives versus uh, progressives. Uh, Candace Kelly, Praveen, uh, Fernandez, thank you for starting your day with us here. Uh, we appreciate it.